Hi there, everyone. Um, welcome to our Research Justice webinar, Introduction to Research Justice. Um, and this is brought to you um, by the Research Justice Collective um, in collaboration with the Data Center, um, as well as the Dream Resource Center and the Survey Research Committee for the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, you're probably all following along with us on the website researchjustice.com. We also have uh, live notes and a chat function that you can um, help us uh, to both take live notes um, as well as um, chat questions that you might have as well. I see that a bunch of you are on there. Um, it's in the window just below um, where you see the live broadcast right now. So you will have to um, register there um, and then set up and then you can both um, introduce yourself there. Sorry about that. I don't know if you all heard that. We're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties here, but um, but I'm really glad to um, see a bunch of you on here, and we're really excited to bring you this um, this webinar. And if you're tweeting today, you can also use the hashtag um, researchjustice.com. So today, um, unfortunately, um, our, our moderator is sitting outside on a bicycle in the blizzard in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> so um, I'm taking over for him. This is Yvonne of the Research Justice Collective. I'm taking over for him until uh, he gets into a warmer place with internet access. Um, and hopefully he will soon. Um, and we're joined today also by Jay Donahue of the Data Center. Um, who's going to talk about the new toolkit um, that uh, the data center has put out, which is an introduction to research justice. Um, and Jay is based um, in the Bay Area. He's been there um, since 2003 and lives in Oakland. He's originally from Pennsylvania. When he's not working at the data center, Jay organizes with critical resistance fighting to abolish the prison industrial complex and end our alliance, reliance on prisons, policing and surveillance as solutions to social problems while simultaneously building strong, self-determined communities. Go Jay! Um, and then we're also joined by Amelda Placencia from the Dream Resource Center. Amelda is the project coordinator of health initiatives at the Dream Resource Center, um, which is based at the UCLA Downtown Labor Center. She currently oversees the Collective of Immigrant Resilience through Community-Led Empowerment, or otherwise known as CIRCLE, the CIRCLE Project, and the Healthy California Cohort of Dream Summer, both of which address the lack of access and health resources for undocumented youth in California. Um, and uh, Imelda is going to present to us a research justice case study um, about Healthy California. And last, um, Kate Diedrich is here from the IWW Survey and Research Committee. She's a member of the IWW in Providence, Rhode Island, and also a graduate student in public humanities at Brown University. She's interested in how art, history, and literature can be used as tools for social resistance. She believes that all workers can open alternative cooperative spaces in workplaces, neighborhoods, and the public domain to challenge inequitable systems. She's worked in union organizing, public education, and spent two and a half years in Greece where she coordinated a study, broad, a study abroad program, taught ESL, and played professional soccer. And Kate's going to talk, talk to us about some of the militant research that uh, the IWW Survey and Research Committee has been engaged in. So I sort of touched upon this really quickly earlier, but um, if you have questions, we have a box underneath the live broadcast where um, there's a chat feature that you can ask questions there on the right hand side. You can also set up your name um, uh, so that it appears um, you know, as you. Um, and there's also notes that you can take on the left hand side. So um, please feel free to chime in and, um, and add your voice into the conversation. Um, and maybe to start off with, we can start off with a question if folks can respond um, through the online notes. Um, what do you think research justice is? What's your conception? 
and I'm going to type this into the notes. What is your conception of research justice? So as as folks, um, you know, join on um, or as you're going through the presentation, um, please feel free to add in your responses to that question about what is your conception of research justice. Okay, great. So. Um, we are going to uh, start off with a presentation by Jay. Um, so Jay, take it away. Cool. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little framing for uh, the two case studies that will be presented by Amelda and Kate. And I wanted to take a look at how um, information and knowledge moves around in the world, um, how research can support um, organizing in a more theoretical way, and um, how political power is connected to knowledge. So Yvonne, if you want to go to the first slide. Cool. Um, so this diagram kind of shows a little bit about um, different kinds of knowledge um, so there's mainstream or institutional knowledge, which you can see on the top of the triangle. Um, and those are things like published facts and data that may be generated or put out in the world by, by research professionals. Right? So um, people maybe in universities or government. Um, and on the bottom you see experiential, cultural, and spiritual knowledge. And those are things like um, our everyday lived experience, um, wisdom that's passed down from our elders or our families, um, and things that we learn from the world that we're living in. And you can kind of see that on, on the other side, there's, there's a spectrum of political power that's connected to that. So the more access that you have to mainstream and institutional knowledge, the more power that you have, and or more political power that you have. And when we're looking at who has that access, who has that greater access, oftentimes um, those folks have privilege based on race, class, gender, and education. Um, but if we want to look at what our vision is, what, what research justice um, can mean, Yvonne, if you want to go to the next slide. So here you'll see some, some explanations of, of the different kinds of knowledge that I just described. But what we want to see is, is really that our experiences, um, our expertise, our, the knowledge that we have um, through our culture, through our living in our communities, that those things are on of equal value and equal legitimacy and have equal political power and sometimes maybe more political power and legitim legitimacy than institutional knowledge. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a vision a vision for for research justice. Could you go to the next slide, please? So this is a, a diagram that we call inside research justice. So it's just taking a little bit of a closer diving in a little bit more. So you can see on the top there are sources of information kind of that we just talked about. So mainstream or institutional information and grassroots information. And on the bottom we see audiences. So there are grassroots audiences and mainstream audiences. Um, so if we look on the, the grassroots side, you know, when we're trying to convey information um, about our own communities to people in our own communities, um, we do that in ways that are very, very accessible ways that we, we understand. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're trying to uh, talk about our experience of, for example, um, increased policing in our, in our neighborhoods, we might paint murals about that or make YouTube videos. Um, and that's something that, that people can see and, and grasp and that, that are really, um, really accessible, things that people can interact with. And on the mainstream side, when, when mainstream is, or institutions are trying to convey information to policymakers or decision makers, um, they might do that through uh, reports or uh, data tables or you know, things like that. Um, and 
that's something that is uh, respected and understood by decision makers and um, policy makers. Where we kind of run into some some problems are when, on the, on the one hand, when um, the grassroots are trying to access information that's produced by institutions. And that's information that we need. Oftentimes it's information about our communities, um, and it's information that's going to be used to make policies that uh, are directed at our communities. And so sometimes even policies that might, that could potentially harm our communities. So we want to be able to know what that, what, what's contained in there. Um, but oftentimes they're, they're hidden, that information is hidden in proprietary databases or might be literally in language that we do not understand. Um, so we, part of organizing and using research for organizing is fighting for the right to know, the right to access that information. And on the other hand, um, we have what sometimes could be called the right to be heard. So when we, we show up at, um, you know, city council where they're going to be talking about policies that are instituting policies that are related to our communities, we show up and we give our narrative of our experience um, and there might be hundreds of people there talking about the same, the same experience, the same shared experience, and we're told that our information is anecdotal or it's, it's biased or, you know, what have you. Decision makers don't believe us, essentially. So we have to fight for the right to be able to generate our own data and for our own knowledge to be listened to by decision makers. So we have to fight for the right to be heard, and that's something that we can do through research and organizing. Yvonne, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is, you know, organizing um, and what we might call research for action um, shows how research can support our organizing and our campaigns. So one thing that organizing does, or several things, is you know we recognize the kinds of power that we hold. We can articulate a vision for a just society. We can create solutions for the problems we face. And we can act together to fight for lasting change. And so you can see that different kinds of research um, can support these four basic uh, tenets of, of organizing, base building, campaign development, leadership development, and organizational development. So for instance, if you're out you know, collecting, um, collecting a survey, you're also building your base. You're also giving people information and letting them know about what you're organizing around. Um, research, research can also support leadership development on an individual level. So, um, you know, sometimes folks don't have any experience with, um, with this kind of kind of research, even though they have lots of expertise. Um, so it's, it's building up people's confidence, people's um, skill levels for um, and building people's leadership in their organizations and in their communities. Um, and we also see organizational development. So it's, it's creating stronger organizations that have more political power and more ability to move their um, social change agendas forward. Um, so I think that kind of sets the, sets the stage for Imelda and Kate. Um, and I guess I just wanted to let folks know that we did just put out this data center produce this research justice toolkit. Um, and on the next slide, there's a, there's a short link to it that maybe can get captured in the notes so folks can, can check it out. Um, and I wanted to thank, I think we all want to thank, um, you know, current and former staff members at Data Center and research interns and volunteers and all of our project partners throughout the years um, who really have helped us to hone and refine our trainings um, and just many thanks for that. So take it away, Imelda.
Hello everyone. Um, so my name is Imelda Placencia and um, I am the uh, Project Coordinator of Health Initiatives here at the Dream Resource Center. We are located at the UCLA Labor Center in downtown Los Angeles. And today I'll be sharing with you um, some of the work that was conducted this summer by our Dream Summer interns. Um, next slide, please. So here at the Labor Center, we um, at the Dream Resource Center, we have a program, um, a national internship program called Dream Summer, where immigrant youth are placed um, within organizations during the summer. And specifically here in California, we receive support from the California Endowment to be able to specifically focus on health within our immigrant communities. Where we are now, uh, and especially since um, the Affordable Care Act has now been implemented, and um, Undocumented communities are explicitly excluded from that policy. It is very, um, it is very significant that we have a voice with the, within um, within uh, this conversation. Everything that is developing, I think that's one of the uh, major factors that we learned at. Um, now we've learned from our immigrant youth movement is that other people's decisions impact our lives and if we don't have a seat at the table, if we don't contribute to that conversation, people will continue making decisions um, for us and at the end of the day it is um, it is our personal lives that, that are very much impacted by those decisions. And a little bit of history with, within research um, here in California, we are um, immigrant youth are very um, are very heavily researched. There's a lot of work that has developed from the immigrant youth movement, and there's a lot of interest. People who are very intrigued about our community, and oftentimes that has been very harmful. Um, there has been a lot of um, a lot of researchers, graduate students that do come into the community and don't. Um, necessarily understand that they are a guest in the community and um, extract information. Oftentimes we don't know what is produced about what is being said about our communities. Um, oftentimes um, um, I have a friend who, who shared her story, was a part of an interview and later found it that it was a part of a book and never even never even knew that that was taking place. So really um, looking at research justice as, as a form of social justice by being able to take ownership over, over our stories and what, what, is, what is being said about our communities. And so, um, so that's within the Healthy California cohort. What we, what we did is um, we conducted statewide research on healthcare access for immigrant youth. Next slide, please. So here is our beautiful research team of 32 interns and five coordinating team members that were all of a part of our Healthy California cohort. Um, all of these uh, beautiful people um, really ranged in educational level, in age level. We had some folks that had just graduated from high school, some people that had just graduated from master's programs. Um, so it's not necessarily a matter of, of capacity. We understand that we are um, we have a lot of agency and. Um, knowledge within our community and it was more of a matter of being able to provide the tools and the opportunity to to be able to conduct this work. So these are actually all of our research team that were able to collect um, our surveys uh, around healthcare access this summer. Next slide please. So what the project really entailed is that through the summer internship program, we provided immigrant youth with the tools and opportunity to produce knowledge about our own communities. And this is, like I mentioned, a little bit about the history of, of how research is generally conducted. Um, this is really a rare opportunity that, that our communities received. We originally had a goal of being able to survey 400 um, immigrant youth um, across California, both undocumented and documented, those that are recipients of deferred action. And we exceeded our goal by being able to reach um, 550, which really allowed us to capture a lot of um, great ex experiences and, and, um, and knowledge about what, what exists in our communities in terms of addressing health care. Next slide, please. And the way that we did this is um, by being able to frame our work under a research justice model. Um, we were very... Um, uh, blessed when we were able to understand our work under under this framework to be able to provide some some guidance of how to be able to direct that work because it is it is a process that is very intentional you are um, being uh, considerate about the community that you're working with and that genuinely takes a lot of effort by being able to recognize the community as experts even being 
able to place them in in that light takes a lot of uh, of um of consciousness and awareness of of the practice that you are participating in acknowledge uh, a community's capacity to be able to produce knowledge it's not that our co our communities don't have that capacity it's that we are not provided with those opportunities um equal access to the information like i mentioned a, a lot of times we don't know what is produced about about our stories and even the analysis that is developed about our our own lives we don't have um, we don't contribute to to that development, and also being able to have the capacity to produce knowledge to affect change. We are developing a report that states all of the information that we captured this summer, and that report is being used more of a tool to be able to advocate for um, the exclusion that is that is taking place here in California of not being able to have access to healthcare. As we um, as we engaged in this practice throughout the summer, um, we had um, some recommendations that we wanted to. Um, to really state for um, it really emphasized with, within the practice of research justice there's a need for reciprocity in, in the process understanding that when someone is participating in a survey when someone is participating in a in in an interview they are, it, they are giving of themselves they are opening they are being vulnerable with you they are uh, oftentimes opening up their wounds um, and um, how to be able to work with that have conversations about that is not generally addressed because um, the the role the researcher is to be able to extract information often leaving open wounds for those that are participating so the need to have implementation of wellness practices everyone that all of our researchers are immigrant youth that um, uh, that live this experience and as they were serving other immigrant youth it was it was very much a mirror into into their lives into what their experience oftentimes um, bringing about triggers for themselves if someone shared that um, their mother was in the hospital and maybe they're experiencing a similar situation um, it there, there was a need to be able to have discussions about what the what um, engaging in this in this practice was bringing up for them and how to be able to address those have resources for those um, a lot of things that we really weren't able to um, to implement this this summer because of the of of um, just moving very quickly with research and and our limited capacity with a lot of the work that we do within our immigrant youth movement um, definitely um, seeing seeing the need for those. Next slide, please. So what the process looked like for us this summer is we did a, we could, we did a lot of traveling. Um, we visited different regions in California, all the way down from San Diego up to Orange County, the Inland Empire, Los Angeles, Central Valley, and then to Northern California. As we visited all of these different regions, we were very intentional about he sharing healing justice practices um, and the necessity for those within our community. Um, we talked about being able to have community talking circles, being able to um, engage in healthy organizing, practices um, being able to create boundaries um, for for our work and our lives um, as, as we give a lot of ourselves when um, when we commit ourselves to social justice work and so being able to, to implement circles having those discussions um, was really um, was really significant within um, all of the traveling that that um, that we did this summer um, the need for inclusivity and reflection um, we were moving very quickly this summer to be able to capture all of those um, all of those surveys and um, uh, a lot of times we had to make sure that we stop and reflect um, how are we being inclusive how are we talking to community members how are we um, engaging our researchers in, in this process um, a lot of things that can definitely um, we we can refine but there there was an intention uh, a genuine intention to be to be able to do that because we understand um, the harm that it cut causes when um, when there isn't that that reflection to be able to to stop and and think through how we are con how we are conducting the work and how it is impacting the community next slide please so there's a lot of positive outcomes that really came out of being able to conduct this work um, first really having the confidence to actively participate in research like I mentioned our researchers really range in age and educational level and research is often um, perceived as a very elite practice often um, our community doesn't have this opportunity to be able to engage in research unless they are able to um, 
to attend a UC, um, be connected in some way to this type of work. Um, but for those who are in community college, who are um, even at the Cal State level, um, often don't participate in this. So even being able to perceive yourself as this is something that I do have the capacity to be able to do. A lot of um, that leadership development that was involved in some of um, what Jay mentioned and some of those um, research justice tenants. Um, being able to provide a deeper understanding of how health impacts our immigrant community. So our undocumented status is really um, something that impacts every aspect of our of our life in one way or another but it is something that we don't really want to want to think about because it is very heavy um, but being able to have an entire summer where we're really um, being able to have an opportunity to sit, um, listen to our community members about what are what are those needs um, was very um, significant. I think for undocumented communities we're so used to um, being um, being neglected, not being heard. Um, so even providing folks with um, um, listening um, was, was very significant. Um, uh, a very crucial point within our, our movement is really the sustainability practice of being able to incorporate health practices within our organizing work. Like I mentioned, when we engage in social justice work, we give a lot of ourselves in the work because our lives are very much intertwine in the work, often our, our, our survival and the survival of our communities. And so we feel the need to be able to be able to give and being able to incorporate all of these health practices is really a form of, of sustainability and how we can continue to, to, um, to take care of each other because we can only continue um, working this way for so long um, until we, we eventually burn out, our bodies give out, and there, there, is, a, there is a dire need for um, being able to access health care. And what's most significant is really this new framework for conducting research with immigrant communities. Um, what's been most significant about our immigrant youth movement is that we are speaking for ourselves, um, we are addressing what the needs are within our community, and we are the ones leading leading that voice um, with the support of of, of our of our allies and friends. Um, but this new framework of conducting research, it's really immigrant youth stating that we um, we don't want to work in this in this way where people come into our communities, extract information, and we no longer hear from them again. We want to be incorporated into this process, into this work. Um, the framework that um, that is being developed, what you are stating about our communities. Um, so as, and that is a very intentional uh, practice, um, but it is something that our community is is in need of and is now um, asking for under this this research justice framework. Next slide, please. So where we are in our report is uh, we're preparing our report for dissemination. It will be um, released at the end of February, early March, and it is very much intertwined with developing an advocacy strategy. Here specifically in California, um, Senator Ricardo Lara um, stated that he will be uh, proposing a bill to cover the remaining uninsured in California, specifically um, the undocumented community. And the report that is being developed, the work that was conducted this summer, um, really informing, is really informing forming that proposal. We'll be using that proposal to visit um, the different regions where we captured those stories throughout the summer to be able to share um, some of the data that was produced and the analysis and co have conversations with community members about what this what this means, our exclusion of, of health care and what we can do to be, ad to be able to advocate and, and push for change. So much like um, the the research in itself is is um, is a practice where we are able to develop our campaign that campaign development that Jay was mentioning as well as leadership development but it is very much a tool to be able to to really validate our stories a lot of the information that was in um, that is in the report when we shared it with um, our research team all of our all of our interns, it's it's information that we already know. It's information that exists in, in, in the community and we know is, is very real to our lives since we carry it every day. And this report is more of, of a way to be able to validate those stories and be able to present those to key stakeholders, policymakers um, who do make um, who do have influence um, and decision making power that impact our lives. Next slide please. 
Um, so here's my contact information, and here are the other two ladies that, that I work very closely with, our, our research coordinators, Alma Leiva and Mayra Joana Jaimez Peña. Um, we are currently the Healthy California team here at the Dream Resource Center that are developing, um, working very closely with organizations to develop that strategy and um, are the authors of the report as well. Um, there's my contact information if you have any other um, questions um, or concerns, I'd be happy happy to share more. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, um, I'm Kate Diedrich, and I am presenting for the um, Industrial Workers of the World, the Survey and Research Committee specifically, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of how research justice is helping on a couple of national campaigns and just to build the capacity of the union. Next slide, please. So, um, the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW, um, were founded in 1905 and have an incredible history in both American and international labor history and just revolutionary social cultural history. So um, I'm not going to go a ton into the history. I really encourage everyone who hasn't been introduced to this union to look into it. The um, IWW website has a lot of great resources and um, links to other resources as well. But one um, key point is that, you know, since its inception, the IWW has been one of the unions that, the first union really that invited women and people of color to be, um, you know, co-collaborators and workers and, and have empowered those communities um, in the model itself. It's also been always a democratically run union, which is key here in thinking about um, research justice and empowering the workers on the floor. Just as a general introduction as well, I think it's important um, to just to note that um, we're going to talk about some campaigns that are really worker-led, and I'm speaking in general about the Survey and Research Committee and um, framing sort of the ways in which a number of SRC and IWW campaigns tie into the framework that Jay outlined and Imelda really sort of um, talked about in detail, and um, there will be further opportunities for you to hear directly from the workers, and I think that's really important. Um, so a few things just to, to outline for those of you who don't know much about the IWW. It is a union that is focused on industrial union or industrial organizing, and that's really key because instead of um, trying to sort of pit workers in different trades against one another in an attempt to just gain sort of some wage concessions and, um, you know, uh, general divided workforces. They, the IWW aims to organize across industries and ultimately to, to create one big union of worker solidarity. Um, and solidarity unionism is another word or phrase we use often. And it um, has a lot to do with actually building power, what we call worker power. Um, and worker power really just means um, empowering people and training them and teaching them as other fellow workers to take on workplace issues directly through direct action, which is, um, you know, it's, it's very much what it sounds like, an action directed at a particular pressure point. And you, we usually talk about it in, in terms of a workplace, like um, taking, you know, confronting a boss when you have a problem, running a picket, um, a strike, a walkout, a slowdown. But it also can just mean, you know, empowering people in their communities or in their, you know, friend groups to take things on directly. So direct action is, is one of the keys, and that ties in with the model of organizing and research um, as well. Another thing um, to point out is that um, the IWW has always set itself as a sort of radical union that is focused on ending the whole system of wage slavery or the wage system instead of just focusing on getting wage concessions. Um, and that's really important as we think about how, um, how research fits in with that. So that's another important point. So if we can just go to the next slide, I'm going to go into what the SRC specifically is working on. Oh, and that's just a great image to, to show you how um, 
how organizing is really key here. And we want um, the workers themselves to sort of be empowered as a collective. You know, yes, individually, but, but also as a collective to do the research that informs the organizing to take down these oppressive power s structures at home and, or, excuse me, at work, in the community and at home. Um, obviously, it's very specific about this being workplace organizing, but um, the model can be, you know, talked about in, in so many different ways. So if we can go to the next slide. Great, so um, specifically kind of talking about the Survey and Research Committee, this is one branch of the IWW's um, organizing department. The goals um, of the SRC are to analyze organizing strategies and tactics in order to support specific campaigns. So to use research to analyze the strategies that workers on the ground are using in a particular campaign. To promote and encourage worker-led research, I think it's, it's so good to go last in this presentation because I think you have a sense of what it would mean for the actual workers on the shop floor or in a particular company to understand that they hold the tools to ask specific questions about the workplace, um, investigate things that they know because of their on-the-ground work. So if someone is in a workplace and they know that um, you know the boss is planning on hiring union busters, they have so much more capacity to go in and, and do the research that's needed to understand who's being hired, how much they're being paid, what traditionally happens in union busting, and then communicate that to the workers on the shop floor in a way that is, is not sort of top-down from the, the research department. Traditional unions often will have, you know, a research department that's very isolated from the on-the-ground organizing and from the workers themselves and, and organizers. So this kind of takes down a number of those, wall, those walls. Um, and that's, you know, that's tied in with this model of creating practices of research that empower and recognize the individual and collective experiences and knowledge, as a, knowledge of workers. And then ultimately, I think that there's a larger kind of structural and macro project to build a strong culture of research justice within the IWW, and that's an ongoing project, and we're really working now on making that intentional and tying that in with um, with the campaigns that have successfully used research to further their goals. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so just to, to introduce you to one campaign um, that many of you might be familiar with. If you're not, you should definitely check out that website there. Um, the Starbucks Workers Union um, has won a number of major wage schedule and health and safety victories in both New York City and Chicago. And that work was, you know, supported by, by research justice, again, on the ground and sort of this more traditional computer-based um, corporate research, as we sometimes call it, to understand, you know, the power structures within Starbucks. But also, again, you know, workers on the ground will need to know kind of what some of the facts are about the company, what their specific Starbucks shop, you know, who, who the managers are, their power, how, who makes decisions, whether there's going to be any anti-union activity. It's, you, we use the, the research to inform flyers and propaganda and education, you know, it was throughout the organizing process and then ultimately once workers in the, in the IWW are more organized, they still are, have an ongoing process of using direct action to take care of things at work. So research continues to be a part of this. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of exciting work continuing with the Starbucks Workers Union across the country. So really thinking about continuing to expand the um, power, worker power and research power of the Starbucks Workers Union will be something that we're working on moving forward. Um, next slide, please. And then a second campaign that is is still ongoing, is specifically in the Twin Cities, is the Jimmy John's Workers Union, um, and and the workers on the ground there are building their capacity to use research to kind of um, advance this campaign, which is at a critical stage and needs a, a lot of support. So they want you know, they want to win um, fair wages, sick days, and just general respect. And research can be a tool that empowers you to kind of do that. 
Um, and so you can check out the Jimmy John Workers Union's website there. And again, with both of these national examples, we hope to be able to offer some you know, further opportunities to engage with the workers that are actually you know, fighting these, these fights. Next slide, please. So um, like many people in the labor movement, the IWW knows that the global supply chains and logistics is a critical space um, for organizing. So kind of this global just-in-time production and distribution has created some critical spaces for organizing and international solidarity. So um, we're going to be working to understand major supply chains worldwide and cross-reference them with a number of labor, um, labor disputes that are ongoing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry my image didn't work on the one before that. It was a kind of a cool um, shot of just how kind of products move around the world, which is something that we're working with, you know, on the ground workers to map out. So again, this is a space in which the people who are actually doing the work know where, where factories are, how they're set up, you know, how trucks drive to ports, what the shipping lines are, where the retail stores are. So having a, a very kind of advanced map of the global supply chain is really important and um, research can help help workers on the ground to better understand their role in this in this sort of just-in-time production. So we will use online tools and databases along with workers inquiry. So, so both of workers inquiry will inform the research and the research will inform sort of workers inquiry and direct action. So at this point we're working with contacts at incredibly important logistic hubs in LA Oakland, Portland, Seattle, New York, New Jersey, and in, even in China. So that's, that work is ongoing, and um, um, stay tuned for more information on that. Next slide, please. Yeah, so there we go with the image. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll continue with kind of this supply chain research and um, it's informed by a lot of what's already happening on the ground, but we are hoping to put together a toolkit for uh, re coordinating readings and continue to host webinars so that we can connect other folks who are doing this kind of work together. Um, and so that's just a little introduction into the exciting work that's going on with that. Next slide, please. Great. So, um, so I just want to say many thanks to everyone who's helped us to kind of coordinate this this awesome webinar. I do see a quick question that I'm going to answer while I still have um, still have the mic. I think it might be unclear. So, the SRC, the Survey and Research Committee, is uh, part of the organizing department of the national and international IWW. So, workers in their local branches can engage with, with the SRC and, and come to us for, you know, to, for training and support and ask for folks to go and, and run sort of what we would do with like an organizer training but for research. Um, so they can access a lot of the information online via monthly phone calls and then also just um, folks on the ground are increasingly being trained and empowered to do this work themselves and then connect it back to the national campaign. So I think that's um, sort of the ultimate goal, as I mentioned, to create this research culture has to do with creating what we would call sort of, you know, campaign development and organizational development. And this is, you know, what everyone wants to do, which is to create, use research to better specific campaigns, but also the organization as a whole and its ability to connect workers on the ground to other workers, to campaigns that have been done in the past, to research that's already been collected. So often, a lot of this work has already been done. R workers know how to sort of, you know, map out their, their shops and understand who makes decisions and call them out, and it's, it's incredible what work has already been done, but it's a lot of what needs to happen and what we're working on is kind of connecting people together and creating an intentional practice and specific toolkits. So um, that's that's all for me.
Hi, everybody. My name is Joe, and I am a little late to the party because of a little thing called snow. But I really want to thank everybody of our presenters who took the time to make these great presentations and took the time to be here uh, today to present them for all of our 80 plus viewers on the internet abroad and potentially even more. Uh, if you're on our website at researchjustice.com, one of the ways that you can interact and some people have already is to pop into our etherpad that's embedded right below the video and uh, hop on and type in any questions you might have. Some folks have been doing this already, so I want to give a chance for our presenters to address some of them. One of the very, uh, we have some questions for individuals as well as, uh, as well as just kind of broader questions. I want to start with one of the broader questions that came up, uh, about just uh, as the role, or sorry, where did it go? The role of the research, the role of the researcher in this model of kind of research justice. Uh, is there, an, is the researcher inside or inside or outside of this, inside or outside of their communities? And is there a name for this type of uh, research that folks? Uh, have for uh, have I guess for this type of research. Um, and feel free to jump in any of our presenters. Um, well, I could I could answer or provide some answer first. Um, so the role of the researcher, I think, in this case, and I think Amelda and Kate both highlighted this really well, is that the the researchers are the community members. So the, the people who are, they, there might be a research partner, but at least with data center, it's, it's a really collaborative approach. So there's a research team that might include um, folks from an organization like data center or another organization. Um, but then the, the community members themselves are conducting the research, creating the, the uh, the tools, uh, analyzing the data, and creating whatever um, dissemination, propaganda, or report, or what have you at the end. Um, so I think we like to call this, at least at Data Center, community-driven research. So the research agenda is really generated by the community members themselves um, and is not um, not brought in by an outside researcher. Awesome. Does anybody else care to chime in on that? Any of our other presenters? Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, what Research Justice uh, does, it, it is very intentional at positioning community members as experts. And so, um, uh, being a part of the community is something that you live and carry every day and um, and often outside researchers um, when they do come into a community there's there's um, a literature review that is developed to be able to begin to develop their understanding um, but as outside members of the community when um, developing the research the analysis the carrying out of the work there are definitely blind spots that exist because that um, it's just their positionality um, they are uh, and not being a part of the community, there's very um, uh, unique experiences that, that that community may have that um, are, are not afforded or, or known um, or would even think to look at um, uh, in certain perspectives because they are um, community members and that's why it's so significant for people that um, are a part of the community, are a very um, intricate part of the, the development, the carrying out and the analysis of the research. I think it's very um, naive to, to think that um, research itself is, is unbiased we are, are human beings and carry a certain understanding of the world that we live in, our positionality. And so, um, and that is projected into whatever is developed, whatever report, whatever um, article is developed about, um, about our communities. Um, but what is significant is that it is directly coming from, from the community, who, people who know it best, to be able um, to, to state who our communities are and what, what our needs are. So one, 
Awesome. Thank you, Imelda and Jay. Uh, one of the question prompts that we had uh, at the beginning of this was about our, con our concepts of research justice, and some folks have some question about the role of the researcher, um, bias and in bias and integrity of in, uh, organizations. Just to give uh, a little bit of a framework, what some of our list, uh, some of our viewers have responded to this uh, prompt as. Uh, so one person writes that research justice is research with communities to move towards more just societal structures. Uh, justice is a conceptual framework, but the idea, uh, maybe this is one uh, work of progress, the idea, or ideas around knowledge. Uh, a key thing for another one of our viewers is developing and sharing information that can be accessed outside of uh, protected or subscription services so that anyone can use them, the kind of idea of uh, the openness of our community knowledge. Uh, shared data that can buttress people, people's movements is another response. Research that challenges the, do the dominant narrative about what knowledge is and what expertise is and who has them. I think that's uh, really clearly a thread through all of our presentations about uh, kind of grounding our, com our communities as experts of their own knowledge. Um, uh, another question from our, our viewers, how can our access relationships be replicated by less resourced organizations and campaigns. Um, I think specifically with regards to something that might be one, uh, Imelda, would you mind speaking uh, to that a little bit? I don't have to put you too much on the spot, but something, that's something that seems like you encountered a little bit uh, in going, going through your survey process. Uh, but I think speaking specifically towards uh, Lever leveraging the resources that we uh, might have, or how, do, how can those who have more resources team up or work with less resourced organi organizations and campaigns? I can, actually, I can maybe jump in there first, yeah. just since the IWW is probably more kind of, uh, sure. has more challenges not accessing sort of the, the business um, research tools. But I think that, um, I think Joe mentioned it on the chat, uh, chat screen, all of the, uh, you know, it's not like research isn't being done by by the other side, by you know mm. all kinds of of people, and so there's a ton of research happening, and there are people who are allies in power structures, in universities, in business unions, at the local library, all kinds of places. So, I mean, someone did mention the library is an important place to know that you can get access to tools like LexisNexis and Hoover's, but there are really expensive databases and some of them, you know, are really helpful to sort of, there's, there's a access to every single business's physical address that only, you know, only well-resourced universities can get. So it is really important, I think, to find, to continue to find allies um, within these power structures because it, we're kidding ourselves if we think that we don't need to ask as undersourced often grassroots um, sort of militant research workers that we need, we don't need to ask for support from allies from within these structures at this point in time. And I think um, it would be great if, I know people are, are adding on the, the menu that there are a lot of other, there, a lot of people even in this conversation have, have knowledge about um, resources, so it would be cool if we could share some of those. Because we're always, we, it is still a struggle and a challenge and we're trying to align communication on how to get to those sources, but it, 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 is, it is difficult. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Okay. Uh, other folks, does anybody else want to chime in on that? Um, I would I would just want to echo what what Kate mentioned. It's um, yes, it's extremely difficult to be able to um, to be undersourced, and often what uh, what takes place is that a lot of personal resources um, are. Are, are used to be able to carry out the work just because we understand that as a community that there is there, there's a need to produce the research of, of how, how it's going to be used. Um, I think um, being able with the leadership development co component, being able to develop that agency within our community to be able to uh, make those direct asks um, for, um, from our allies, um, folks that are very intentional. Um, I think uh, we're so used to kind of just um, figuring out what we can with what we have, and um, but the need to be able to um, continue strengthening partnerships and really um, uh, working alongside um, our our allies. Um, that was a that was a great point. 
For sure. And I think one one question that comes to mind, I, I know that uh, I was waiting to see where this would come in, but we have one from Jason uh, about academic institutions. Academic institutions seem to be like a very visible uh, site for a lot of research, but a lot of times they aren't the most just in their practices. Where, how do we see academic uh, partnerships fitting in to our model of research justice? So um, from my end, I, I actually started um, uh, started uh, with conducting research when, when I was still um, uh, an undergrad at UCLA and being able to um, really uh, un understand what that entails. I really... I didn't know what the framework or uh, a different way to be able to approach it. Re the methods of research justice weren't introduced to me, but I just knew that the, it was it was a, a very harmful approach. And I think um, through being able to um, continue having these conversations about research justice and um, being uh, we we do um, conduct collaborative work with um, our academic partners um, because uh, like like Kate mentioned, I think it would be naive of us to to feel like they're um, like we can can stand outside of them, or or we don't need um, to to be in partnership or in community with them. Um, we are in community with them and um, are all developing information about um, our our uh, about about our lives, about our communities, and so um, we're beginning to have conversations with academics, especially those that work with immigrant communities, about how they are conducting the work and being able to um, um, to express the need of how how crucial it is to have um, immigrant youth be a part of that work. There definitely is um, a lot of a lot of resistance, a lot of um, people that are generally used to conducting research in a certain way, as well as um, it being um, really devalued because of working with community members. And those are some of the those are more um, uh, personal perspectives and traditions of being able to conduct this work. But as we're seeing with research, and as we're hearing for community. For community members, it is harmful. It is it is damaging. It leaves open wounds. And um, if if it isn't um, advantageous to the to the community that you're working with, there there is a need for for reciprocity. It's not okay to come in and have um, and extract information, take information um, from our communities. And I I think. Um, more academics are beginning to to be able to understand that to to respect that, um, um, but it it is it is a it is a gradual process. There is resistance, um, but there is an intention to have more collaborative work. Yeah, I I totally agree. Th thanks for that, Emilda. I think it, sometimes it can be a strategic choice for a community or grassroots organization. Um, to partner with the university, um, but I think, as Melda mentioned, um, there are certain things that need to be agreed upon up front. I think one thing that we run into a lot is the issue around around publishing, and then who has ownership over the data um, after the project is is over. Um, a lot of times, universities have rules around um, both publishing and um, even like destroying data when when a project is over. So ensuring that there's some kind of um, agreement or contract where the community can state um, its needs up front. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters, all of our viewers for joining us, um, all of our presenting organizations, the Data Center, uh, the Dream Resource Center at the UCLA Labor Center, the IWW Survey and Research Committee, um, our Research Justice Collective um, for making this all possible, all of our viewers at home uh, or at work or wherever you might be viewing us from. Uh, the, I wish we could answer all these questions. There's so many great questions going on on our uh, uh, Etherpad right now. I really wish we could get to all of them. There's a, a really important one that we don't have time necessarily for, but I want to just put into people's head is the role of youth, uh, of our youngest uh, kind of inquirers and uh, in their own movement of placement that I think is oftentimes overlooked. Um, and a couple of reminders. Uh, for all these questions that you might want to ask more, there's one uh, kind of commentary running along uh, about connecting all of these 
uh, kind of pieces and resources together this upcoming June uh, 19th through the 22nd in Detroit. Uh, we have a network gathering and a track of uh, sessions which we're currently accepting proposals for. These proposals are due March the 1st and you can, we would really love to see uh, all sorts of the great uh, folks who worked to mention today uh, propose a session for the Allied Media Conference here in Detroit. Um, and you can find more information on that at amc.alliedmedia.org, which is right up on your screen. And we're curr we currently have a survey app, uh, as well. If you're interested in joining our Research Justice Collective, also up on your screen, uh, bit.ly slash Research Justice 2014 survey, all over case. Uh, if you're interested, we'd let, love for you to fill that survey out by March 1st. Um, you can follow us, as always, on our hashtag at uh, Research Justice. Um, and if there's anything else that you come across in any of your trials on the Internet, feel free to hashtag it or post us up. Um, super big thanks to Yvonne for maintaining all of the tech stuff while we, it got sorted through... Uh, I feel like this has been a really great time and it was really awesome to see all this work come together. There's Yvonne. Big claps for Yvonne. Um, again, uh, this is just this, you know, continuing conversation that's been having. Uh, I really look forward, hopefully, to hearing, seeing session proposals uh, for you for the Allied Media Conference or seeing you at our network gathering or at the very least keeping this conversation going online. <laughs>